Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. We have to preserve all of this, everything that happened, and I've gotten hooked on it and I can't let it go. The legacy of educator John S. Dawson that lives on more than a century later. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. More on that story in a moment, plus the secret to a long and fulfilled life from a 101-year-old woman who will amaze you. But right now on The State We're In, the week's headlines. The repeal of Obamacare has failed. GOP Senator John McCain, just back from a brain cancer diagnosis, cast the decisive vote derailing the Republicans' seven-year plan to dismantle President Obama's signature health care plan. Together, Louisiana criticized Senators Bill Cassidy and John Kennedy for their votes on the health care bill. President Trump's reaction, he tweeted, let it implode, with leaders on both sides calling his attitude unpresidential. Finally out of the hospital, Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana discharged after spending six weeks recovering from severe wounds after a gunman opened fire back in June. Governor John Bell Edwards and countless others tweeted well wishes. Scalise now begins intensive rehab so he can eventually return to work. The BTR plan will make investments into major quarters across our parish in order to better move traffic and improve mobility. That's Baton Rouge Mayor Sharon Weston Broom announcing her proposed transportation tax. She says it will ease some of the capital city's daily traffic headaches. Most of the work is slated for South Baton Rouge. BTR, the Better Transportation and Roads Plan, would raise half a billion dollars over 30 years with the five mil property tax. In practical terms, someone with a $200,000 house would pay $62.50 extra a year. Voters will decide on it in November. Former Mayor Kip Holden criticized Broom's forced ouster of BRPD Chief Carl Dabity, saying it will come back to haunt her. Broom wanted Dabity out, and this week he retired, so to speak. Dabity had been chief since 2013 and with the force 30 years. A standing ovation met LSU football coach Ed Ogeron at this week's Rotary Club in Baton Rouge. Coach O beamed about defensive coordinator Dave Aranda and new offensive coordinator Matt Canada. Canada's offenses are known for scoring a lot of points and keeping opposing defenses guessing. I was talking to him about his goal line offense. He said, Coach, they got two great plays. I said, let me see him. He's got a little tackle screen where the tackle goes behind the quarterback and he throws to the tackle and the tackle scores a touchdown. Then he's got a tackle in the round. I said, yeah, that's pretty nice, Matt. I said, but we got a running back here named Darius Geis. <laughs> I said, how about we give him the ball on the goal line? Because if we don't, they're going to run me and you out of bad rooms. The Tigers open September 2nd against Brigham Young at NRG Stadium in Houston. Cajun musician D.L. Menard passed away at the age of 85. Nicknamed the Cajun Hank Williams, Menard first picked up a guitar as a teenager. The Erath native is best known for the classic Cajun hit, La Porte en Arrière. For decades, West Feliciana Parish has earned top five rankings, putting it among the best school districts in the state. That's in contrast to a number of studies, including one from the Brookings Institute, showing that minorities and the disadvantaged pull down test scores. To understand why the parish has bucked that trend and historically gotten the best out of its students, who are mostly black, you have to go back to one man responsible for instilling a legacy that lives on today. African American students in West Feliciana Parish outperform their peers across the state and indeed across the nation in many categories. 
and much of that is due to the priority of education in the culture of West Feliciana Parish that crosses all racial lines, it crosses all economic lines. Many attribute the long line of success in educating blacks in the St. Francisville area to John Sterling Dawson. He was a 19-year-old black teacher escorted into the parish by two white men in 1890, only 25 years after the end of slavery. At that time, most Negroes didn't know anything other than farming and housework. Dawson started teaching at a small black church overflowing with students before this two-room school was built. He said that they had about 125 kids and only about 20 could read. Now, uh, you have a tremendous task there, but he was smart enough to know that since he couldn't do it, he had to develop what he called a grade A class, students who could learn a little faster and he got them to help him to teach the other kids. Like he got these ad machines, it added up here. The vision of fraction, multiplying, dividing, and adding. Former Dawson student and civil rights attorney Johnny Jones says by the time he graduated from the little elementary school, he was able to run a sawmill in Woodville, Mississippi. Mr. Huggin, that's, that's who was over the superintendent of that, that sawmill at that time. It was around some lumber, co lumber company. He would let me run the company. And so my daddy came up there to Woodville, Mississippi, and saw that I was shipping all the lumber, and the people went out into town, and everybody was talking about the little black boy, who wasn't calling me by that name then, was down there shipping lumber. You know, and say he keeps a sharp pencil. Meant that I would, I would figure out all exactly what they order. That's when Jones's father decided to send him to Baton Rouge for high school. Dawson also emphasized history and geography. Like these foreign countries and things, I didn't know anything too much about that. A lot, a lot upon the hill. By the time Dawson died in 1950, plans were underway to build the first high school large enough for all of the blacks in West Feliciana Parish. The new school was completed in 1951 and was named after Dawson. Dawson and his wife Corrine had four grown children, all of whom were teachers. The two sons would go on to run the new school. Big John, as we call him, who was my principal, and I am a graduate of class of 1958. Uh, Big John was the first principal from 1951 through 61, and Thomas was the principal from 62 to 69. The Dawson boys kept the legacy of their father going until the school closed in 1969. Retired Army General Isaac Smith studied under John Dawson Sr. and John Dawson Jr., as well as Thomas Dawson. He says there's no way he would have gotten an education without the commitment of the Dawson family. They had to pick him up and take him to school. Henry Hardy would go on to become a college professor. Henry Ferdinand Williams told me that one day I would be a professor of chemistry at Harvard. Now you think about it, this is 1957. I knew nothing about Harvard. Didn't know where Harvard was, in Massachusetts. I knew nothing about any of that. But that's what they did. They instilled those things in us. I did not become a professor of chemistry at Harvard but I did become a professor of mathematics at several universities throughout this country. Leandre Williams went on to get his PhD at LSU and worked for both Southern and LSU before becoming the chancellor of the Southern University Ag Center. He credits the Dawsons with teaching life lessons that went far beyond the classroom. The school also stressed discipline, which back then meant whippings. The teacher was authorized to whip you if you didn't do certain things or you did something wrong, they were authorized to whip you. Dawson teachers gave students a wide array of experiences, from crowning school queens to social engagements in other parishes. The teachers did take us different places for, uh, you know, concerts and plays and different things. So we were exposed to a lot of stuff when we were in uh, at Dawson High. Dawson High was closed in 1969 when the parish was forced to integrate its schools. But by then, every black family in the parish had been influenced by the Dawson family and the teachers they brought to the parish. Generations later, the descendants of those Dawson graduates are doctors, lawyers, and engineers working from coast to coast. Among them, Farnell Akingbala, an aerospace engineer for Boeing, and his sister Felicia, a pediatric psychiatrist who teaches at Baylor University Med School in Houston. And also doctors Allison Doherty Mitchell and Pamela Lewis, both working in Louisiana. 
Fundraising efforts are underway right now for money to renovate the old Dawson High School and turn it into a community center with space to also house some high school classes. Now you'll meet a woman I've happened to know since I was nine or 10 years old. Our families lived in University Acres in Baton Rouge, and I sold the surplus tomatoes that my father grew in his garden to neighbors. She was one of my many customers. Even then, I knew that she was unique. For example, they had a pet monkey. No one else had that. This week, I got reacquainted to talk about something else she's done that nobody else has, and I learned more about why, at 101 years old, Mrs. Julia Hawkins is one of a kind. I've written my life story and I say it's been wondrous. What first strikes you about Julia Hawkins, born February 10th, 1916, is that at 101 years old, she lives and moves unlike almost anyone her age, maybe even half her age. She describes her life as wondrous and by all accounts it has been. Most others simply say she's amazing and her latest chapter has caught the attention of people around the world. A 101-year-old woman, Julia Hawkins, making history for her age group. Let's cheer and clap as loud as we can. In just the past few months, the media has marveled at the great grandmother and retired school teacher and natural athlete. She's etched her name in the world record books in the 100-yard dash at the USA Track and Field Masters Championships and the National Senior Games, drawing praise from TV networks and magazines like Sports Illustrated, Runner's World, and People. When did she start running? Last year, after she turned 100. But she was never one to sit still, saying her lifelong swimming and cycling helped her maintain great health. Until recently, she rode her bike three miles a day. I always did something. I was busy, busy, busy with four children. You stay busy and I love the yard. I was in the yard a lot. She was in her 80s when the Senior Olympics lured her into competitive cycling, but gave it up after the 2001 Nationals because of a lack of competition. Her children encouraged her to compete again. Last year, the kids signed me up for biking and for the 50 yard dash in the Senior Olympics. Their persuasion is what ultimately led to those record breaking performances. Name one and see if I don't have it. When she's not turning heads with her athletic feats, she's likely tending to her lush backyard with more than 50 types of trees. I see pecan, I see cypress, um, maple you have. And you have Japanese maple over there, right? You know the white window up there? Yeah, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Sycamore. Oh, yeah. Birch and beech. When did you start wearing flowers in your hair? In college. I pick them and then I don't have anywhere to, you know, I smell them and look at them and then I wonder what to do with them and put it behind my ear works. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a secret to life, what would that be? Marry a good man, because I really think that life was so pleasant married to my husband for 70 years that anything, I mean, everything was ideal. She met Buddy Murray Hawkins her first day at LSU, and they went out for eight years. Then she says Pearl Harbor happened, and he was there in the middle of it, working for the Navy. I was fishing that day with his father in the river, and they called out and said, Pearl Harbor's been bombed, and ooh, it was so terrible. And it was eight days before we knew that he was all right. He was all right, but anxious to tie the knot. We were married by telephone. After the bombing, they wanted to send him out with the fleet, so um, he was afraid I'd marry somebody else or something which I wouldn't have, but he got in touch with me and said, let's get married. Here's her wedding day photo outside the courthouse in Ponchatoula, minus the groom. I got a Baptist minister who used to be in the Navy, 
and this is a naval officer that's getting married and he thought that was neat so he said I'll be glad to do it and my husband had a Jewish rabbi who had the duty that day. After settling in Baton Rouge, she and Buddy, who became an acclaimed educator and petroleum engineer, built their house, which he still lives in today. And he had a book at first, how to do it. And I had two little children that were one and three or something like that when we first started. And by the time we moved in, they were almost two and four. That was 1949, and in the years that followed, their life flourished. They raised their family and began reading books aloud to each other. We read hundreds of books and united us in a way that I can't explain, except it was great. In March of 2013, her husband quietly passed away in his sleep. He lived to be 95, and as I was telling you, he sang love songs to me that night. Buoyed by her lifetime of sweet memories and ready to make new ones, will Julia Hawkins compete again? Right now, she has no plans for that, unless, of course, her children sign her up for another race. And if she wants to take on the challenge, on your mark, get set. Wow. One other note, Mrs. Hawkins told me the only time she ever stopped moving was when she was a child and she got paid to be still. Her family owned a hotel and it was busy. And so she'd get in the way of all the people checking in, checking out. To sit still, her parents paid her a nickel. Last year, Governor Edwards made changes to the program that looks to entice businesses that need big investment money to the state. It gives the industry an exemption on their local property taxes. Many call it the most generous program of its kind in the country. Have the changes made a difference? On Wednesday night, LPB's Public Square examined the changes from every angle. And Kelly Spires is here now to summarize. Kelly. Andre, a state board administers the Industrial Tax Exemption Program, or ITEP. It allows new or expanding businesses an exemption on local property taxes for up to eight years. Joining us for our discussion were our panelists, Louisiana Economic Development Secretary Don Pearson, Grassroots Advocate Broderick Baggart, Louisiana Chemical Association President Greg Bowser, and Calcasieu Parish Assessor Wendy Serpy Aguilard. Barry Irwin, President of the Council for a Better Louisiana, hosted our show, Louisiana Public Square Industrial Tax Matters. The proponents of the program say it stimulates investment and creates jobs. Critics say ITEP reduces local taxes and, by extension, local services. While the program was championed by former Governor Jindal, Governor Edwards made changes to it last June, including bringing local government into the decision-making process. Steve Nosaka is the mayor of the town of Gramercy in St. James Parish. Our single biggest advantage is, uh, is infrastructure. The Mississippi River is, uh, is like none other. Rob Landry is with the Louisiana Chemical Association. The advantages Louisiana sees in having lush natural resources and availability to massive waterways is negated by our unbalanced tax structure. Diane Hanley is a volunteer with an interfaith group that's active in state and local politics. It's called Together Baton Rouge. Together Baton Rouge argues that ITEP hasn't lived up to its promise to create jobs. Should we be incentivizing for there to be less jobs created? Um, well, that's not called an incentive, that's called a gift. Joining us to explore industrial tax matters is our studio audience. It includes members of the Louisiana Municipal Association and the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. The competing tax administrators within a parish, uh, their priorities, the dynamic between them, their needs, um, there is no bright line formula that works. So it really takes uh, a very labor intensive cooperative effort between uh, municipal governments, parish governments, all the stakeholders, school boards, and of course business and industry. Catherine from Together Baton Rouge. We're number one in the, the amount we give in the industrial tax exemption. We're number one in the nation. And um, if you look at what the states close to us give, they don't give a fraction of it. 
we have the false choice of whether it's schools or a giveaway to corporations. That's not really the choice because in many of those $88 billion worth of projects would not be here to pay money into the schools when they come off the industrial tax exemption. 300 companies uh, have received this exemption every year or almost every year since the year 2000. Those 300 companies were not brought here by this exemption, at least not in the last 15 years. They keep getting it. They've gotten $11.6 billion in subsidy. These 300 that have continually got it. Those 300 companies had 86,000 full-time employees in the year 2000, and they have 44,000 full-time employees now. The model that speaks to all this lost revenue makes some very, very wrong assumptions. First of all, that the world would be the same with or without that ITEP exemption. That's not true. What it has morphed into is not new investments. It's replacements of machinery that have to happen anyway. There is an opinion in the room that business is going to come because we have the Mississippi and the Gulf Coast. The majority of the state, including the eight regions that I used to work in, we don't touch the Mississippi. We don't have the Gulf Coast. We're in the middle of the state. It's the profit motive. When the profit motive is there and they're making money, they don't need to be separately incentivized. The case you're talking about where without this they go one place and uh, with this they come here is about 3% tops. In 97%, there's no location element being decided, right? The question is, should we be asking our school boards to put up hundreds of millions of dollars to subsidize that when they're going to do it anyway when they're in a location because it's, it's bringing them profit to make those There's jobs. a lot of head shaking right, about whether those jobs are going to come. That they've got to come up with money. And it's back to this program doesn't cost a dollar. No. It That's is, factually it untrue. Is, it, it, Secretary it, Pearson, it, that is factually it's untrue. It's absolutely true. I mean, how I do you take the revenue off? If you don't have the company there, how are you going to gain revenue from it? You don't get any revenue until that company makes an investment and puts people to work. But it, if they're already here the making routine investments that they would have made Those anyway, are the companies we want to see expand. Well, and you're, that's you're, well, here's where we're happy to agree with you. We want every deal to have an analysis and a return on investment for the state that's good for the citizens. And that's where we operate at Louisiana Economic Development. To your question, one of the things I think is very important, it, it's not about car dealerships or hospitals. This program, this industrial uh, tax exemption program is only for manufacturers. When you throw that rock in the water, the ripples go everywhere. For the full conversation, you can catch Louisiana Public Square Industrial Tax Matters Sunday at 11 a.m. Back to you, Andre. Quite the interesting conversation. The opinions were flying. Kelly, thank you for that report. Antiques Roadshow is one of LPB's most watched programs part auction, part history lesson, a bit of suspense as the roadshow sizes up heirlooms to see if they're worth big money. LPB's Gary Allen reports this roadshow from New Orleans did not disappoint. The Antiques Roadshow made its way to New Orleans this past weekend. Thousands of people from all over the South came to find out if they had a valuable piece of history or just an interesting lamp from Aunt Brenda. The Roadshow has been on the air for 21 seasons and is one of the most popular PBS shows. Eight and a half million viewers watch each week. New Orleans is a halfway stop for the Roadshow, which will visit six cities this summer. Other cities include Harrison, Pennsylvania, Portland, Oregon, and Newport, Rhode Island. Each city will provide enough stories for three shows. The 22nd season of Roadshow begins airing in January of 2018. This weekend's event was held at the New Orleans Convention Center. Each venue has to be large enough to hold 3,000 people, volunteers, staff, and the Roadshow set. About 7,000 appraisals will be given. Marsha Bimco is Roadshow's executive producer. I think Roadshow is such a big hit because we appeal to different people for different reasons. You have the antiques enthusiasts who know what I know now after doing the show all these years, and that is great objects are one of a kind. Many of us who just want to watch a smart reality television show, you will learn when the Civil War happened. You're going to learn a lot about our country and the world, and you're not even going to notice you're learning. <laughs> of the thousands of antiques appraised at each show, about 150 are recorded, with only 30 stories making it to broadcast from each city. 
It takes an army of appraisers to evaluate these priceless objects, and none of them get paid. It's true, we do volunteer our time. We are not paid. They give us a lovely breakfast and lunch. But you know, you do it for, it's like personal, professional development, is I'm sure why a lot of people do it, to meet different people, to see different jewelry. It's just exposure. The more you're exposed, the better you are at your job. Leah, who has been with the Roadshow for 18 years, enjoys meeting the people and catching up with her fellow appraisers. You never know what you're going to see. I love the commitment of the audience. I love that they come from literally all over the country to experience this event. And you, it's like a treasure hunt every time. And I also love the camaraderie with the other appraisers. And you can always learn something by listening to someone else's appraisal. People come to the Roadshow for different reasons. For me, story is king. One of my favorite things from last season is an object that was worth four to $600, but I just love the story. During World War II, New Orleans was a home to Higgins boat builders who built the famous landing craft used in the D-Day invasion. General Dwight D. Eisenhower credited the Higgins boats with winning the war. David, a roadshow enthusiast, showed up with several posters from that era. So we have some uh, landing craft posters from World War II, and basically what these were were uh, training posters for the classroom for the soldiers so when they loaded the vehicle, they knew where to go efficiently and quickly to load and offload onto the beaches. Each one, I have one on both sides of each card. I got three cards and they were worth about three, three fifty a piece. Even if your Fender guitar doesn't make it to the broadcast, every item people will bring will be appraised. Whether it's a $30 Mardi Gras necklace or a $100,000 Rembrandt painting, everybody walks away happy knowing more about their history and their family. Gary Allen, thank you for that. It's been 16 years since the Roadshow was in New Orleans. This summer, the production will visit six cities and appraise more than 54,000 items. The new season premieres in January 2018. Did you or a family member or someone you know serve in the Vietnam War? If so, LPB wants to preserve and share the story. Every Wednesday, LPB invites you to our studios in Baton Rouge to record your Vietnam experience. You can also share your history with us of videos, photos, or written stories at lpb.org Vietnam. To learn more about scheduling an interview, simply go to our website or call us at 225-767-4204. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching, and until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.